So I mentioned in the previous activity that the impulse response of an LTI system completely characterizes the system. And so let me show you that, that that's the case mathematically. Here we have shown that the impulse response of any linear time invariant system completely characterizes the system. So let's consider a situation where we have a system, which I'm going to denote as a block diagram, and a transformation. And we are going to have an input, x of n, to produce an output, y of n, which is the transform that system, that operator, operating on the signal x of n. Okay. Now, t can be any system, can be linear, can be nonlinear, it can be time invariant, meaning it does not change with time, or it can be time variant, for instance, an adaptive filter. For all systems, if x of n is a particular type of input, meaning an impulse, so a signal that is zero everywhere, all the values of in n are zero, except for n equals zero, at which case it's equal to one. If that's what we put at the input, if our input is an impulse, a unit impulse, our output, our response to that input, has a particular name, and we denote as H of N, and that's the impulse response, the response of the system when the input is an impulse. Okay, so H of N is the impulse response. Impulse response. Response means output. When the input is an impulse. Okay. So, you can input an impulse in any system and you will get an impulse response. For one class of systems, those that are LTI, this signal here, the impulse response, completely characterizes the system. Meaning, once you have H of N, you don't need to know anything else about the system. Okay? You have all the information that about the system to, complete, to compute the output for any other signal, to compute the frequency of response, to compute anything in the system function. So let's do that. Let's show that that's the case. Now we are imposing some structure in T. T is not any system. It is an LTI, linear time invariant. And so what happens when the system is LTI? If I put an input, an impulse, and I delay it, M minus K, for instance, because the system is time invariant, I know what the output is going to be, right? My output is going to be H, well, the impulse, it has the same form that we had before, H of N. If you delay the input, you just delay the output, but this is the same output, H of N minus K. This is what this means. And what have we used? That the system is time invariant. The system does not change with time. The input today will produce the same output as if you provide the same input time later, one hour later, two hours later, one day later, one year later. Okay? So what we have seen is if we provide an impulse at the input and we get an impulse response at the output, the response of the system when the input is an impulse, if we delay that impulse by k, so this is what we have done, if that was the original impulse, this is a particular number, k equals 
A to 2, for instance. This is 1. 0 everywhere. The output will have the same form, only that it is delayed. And that's time invariance right there. That will only happen for time invariant systems. If the system is adaptive and it's changing, that will be a different impulse response at a different point in time, possibly. So that's the first thing. Now, what happens if instead of putting an impulse, a unit impulse, we put an impulse that is scaled by a particular value, um, a scalar, I'm going to call that x of k times delta m minus k. This is a scalar. One, two, five. What is, if the system is LTI, the output is just going to be h of m minus k times that scaling factor, x of k. Okay? You multiply it times a scaling factor at the input, and you get that the same impulse response multiplied times that scaling factor. Now, because the system is linear, we call, what happens if we add a bunch of these impulses? So not just one here, but we can add another impulse with another value, another impulse, another impulse, another impulse, another impulse, another impulse here, right? The particular one that we did before, like for instance for k equal 2, could be this one, uh, for k equal 3, this may be 2, that impulse there. Now we, we saw previously that any signal can be decomposed into a sum of unit impulses that are a scale. And so, what happens if I do x of k, delta m minus k, I'm going to add for k equals minus infinity to infinity. So I'm picking different values of k, of the signal k, this by the way is my x of n. I just decomposed x of n into a sum of impulses, so any signal x of n can be decomposed into a weighted sum, so here you have a sum of what? Impulses that are scaled by those factors of, of n, as you can see here, right? Because keep in mind that, that the delta, the unit delta function is zero everywhere, so you just pick that particular value, that x of k. So what is the output? when we put this input. The system is linear. And if it is linear, right, this sum, we're going to have that the output, if we knew what the input was for the impulse, which was the impulse response, and the scale impulse, which was the a scale impulse response, if we add a sum of those, the output is the sum of the outputs. So this is just simply x of k, h of m minus k, for k equals minus infinity to infinity. Okay, so what we are seeing there is that we have an expression for the output, notice y of n, for any signal x of n is given by <coughs> the values of the signal here, x of k, multiply times the impulse response. shifting and then adding it together this 
is the convolution sum. It is the discrete time equivalent to the convolution integral in continuous time. Let's back up for a second. So what have we done here? For any system, if we put an input that is an impulse, we get a response that is the impulse response. The response of the system where the input is an impulse. If the system is LTI linear and time invariant, you put an impulse in, you record what the output is. Let's imagine something like this. This is H of N. And this H of N does signal at the output completely characterizes the system. That means that if you have the system, the signal, and you don't know anything else, I don't give you anything else, for any other input, x of n, you're able to compute the output. It's a complete characterization. How do you do it in the dynamic domain? With this sum, the convolution sum. Also, we are going to see that if you do the Fourier transform of the impulse response, you get the frequency of response of the system. How the system behaves as a function of frequency, okay? So the Fourier transform of H of N of the impulse response is going to give us the frequency response, how this behaves as a function of frequency. Now, which Fourier transform? It depends on the type of system. If it is continuous time, then it's going to be the continuous time Fourier transform. If it is discrete time, it's going to be the discrete time Fourier transform, which computationally we are going to implement as the digital Fourier transform, and for which we have a fast algorithm, <coughs> the FFT, to do an efficient computation of the digital Fourier transform, or sometimes also called discrete Fourier transform, but more properly is digital Fourier transform. So, LTI systems and only LTI systems have a signal that if you put an impulse, you record that impulse response, and with that impulse response, you have everything that you need about the system to compute the output in the time domain as well as to look at the frequency domain. So this is very useful because you, you may have a black box there and all you have to do is to put a very simple signal. Zero, 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 one, zero, 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 zero. You record the output and that's it. Now, if this was an FIR filter, that they are the ones that we are studying, the, the T has a particular form, right? The form of the FIR filter y of n equals b0 times x of n causal implementation v1 x of n minus 1 plus that 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 p m x of n minus m notice that if you put an impulse here and the input if x of n is an impulse you will see that the impulse response that you get are going to be the filter coefficients. I'm going to put it in vector form. These are the fil filter coefficients. Meaning the impulse response of an FIR filter are the filter coefficients of the difference equation. Of course, it completely characterizes the system because there is a difference equation that you can plug it in, I will give you the output. Now, this, <coughs> In the case of an FIR filter, because you have a finite impulse response, this does not have to go from minus infinity to infinity. This becomes, in a causal implementation, the sum from k equals 0 to m x of k times h of n minus k, which, by the way, It is also equal to, so that's that will be the finite convolution sum in the case of a finite impulse response filter, meaning the impulse response after some value of n, it becomes zero. So it is FIR. <clears throat> this you, you can also denote as the summatory from B of k, x of 
n minus k, k equals 0 to m, which is what we have here. And these are all equivalent equations. So we can complete the output like this, you can complete the output like this, understand that there is a relationship between the input response of an FIR filter and the filter coefficient. They are equal. This only happens for finite impulse response filters. It's not the case for infinite impulse response filters. Okay. Completely characterized. Notice that when we are doing this operation in an FIR, the system is clearly LTI, meaning these coefficients do not change, do not depend on n. It's not like you have a B of n or B0 as a function of n. They always stay constant, independently of the n. They are constant, therefore it's time invariant, and it is linear because it's a sum of, is a weighted sum, or a scaled versions of the input. If it is causal, present, and past inputs. So recall, the impulse response of an LTI system, whether in continuous time or in discrete time, is a complete characterization of the system. Because if you have the impulse response, you can find the output for any other input by using the convolution integral in continuous time or convolution sum in discrete time. Impulse response exists for all systems, but only characterizes the input, characterizes the system for LTI. And finally, for the FIR filters that we are studying, the impulse response equals, to, equals the filter coefficients. We are going to see that if we pick those filter coefficients and we do the Fourier transform, in this case, the discrete time Fourier transform, we will see the frequency of response. So we're going to go from having some B coefficients, P0, P1, Bm, You do a Fourier transform of that, and we are going to get the frequency response. How the is the frequency? How the system behaves as a function of frequency, evaluating the kind of frequency, the roll off, the, etc. We are going to see also in future videos that if we take the C transform, the C transform. of the impulse response, we get the system function or the transfer function. Okay? And that's the equivalent to analogous to in continuous time, taking the Laplace transform of the impulse response of a continuous time system to find the transfer function in the S domain. Thank you.